एस एल टी मोबिजाओ दी कनेक्शन एस एल टी मोबिजाओ दी कनेक्शन लेंगा तो कुमार वैटी करेगा ना लाओजी रुपये अल पन्ना टाडू कला मामे एन अब इतने कब बोम Tonight, bad choice of words. SJB MP Ranjan Ramanaika gets a four-year rigorous imprisonment stretch for contempt of court. Keeping promises, cabinet spokesperson assures the government's commitment to honouring Sri Lanka's international debt obligations. We are confident we will be able to settle the entire amount without any default. Also refutes government's hard stance on public issues. That's an impression and a feeling that you have. Government has not decided to be soft or hard at any time. Red-handed. Court told of ETI director's empty promise to the central bank to sell off Swarnavahini to repay depositors when issues surfaced. Ready for reopening. The Bandaranaik International Airport earns the Global Safe Airport accreditation before the January 21st reopening. Now this uh, certificate that we issued from the highest international organization. So this is good enough to develop the tourism in Sri Lanka. Hopefully we will be getting the same accreditation for the Matale Airport soon. All that and much more coming up on First at 9 this Tuesday the 12th of January 2021. अल्कोहल अडंगो हैंड सैनिटाइजर बावित कराने, लेड रोग ऐतिहासिक विषय पीछे वाले टा एरे ही वसा टांग कराने, हाँ तो वादी में मिलन रुपया तुम से पन है। From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana first at nine, live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhamni Kekanai. The court heard today that the four former directors of the ETI Finance had told the central bank that they would sell Swarnavahini and pay back the depositors when the central bank became aware of the financial crisis at the institution and Swarnamahal. At the end of the proceedings, the four suspects were further remanded until Friday, when the court is due to deliver its ruling on their bail application. The case pertaining to the alleged financial fraud committed at the ETI Finance Limited was taken up before the Colombo Chief Magistrate today. Owing to the COVID-19 risk, however, the former directors of the institution, who are in remand custody and are presently at the quarantine centres in Kalutara and Valikada, were not produced before court. Though the case was previously taken up before Colombo Additional Magistrate Ruan Nelundenia, today it was taken up before Colombo Chief Magistrate Mohamed Mihar. Senior Deputy Solicitor General Haripriya Jayasundara told the court that though the central bank's regulatory process uncovered that both ETI Finance and Swarnamahal were in financial crisis even as far back as 2012, the two entities had continued to accept public deposits thereafter. She added that by the time the central bank appointed a panel to manage the affairs of both companies in 2018, ETI Finance had liabilities amounting to 6.4 billion rupees, while Swarnamahal's liabilities amounted to 7.2 billion rupees. Further, the total of 13.6 billion rupees in deposits had been kept in undisclosed accounts, ensuring that they were not detected by the central bank's radar. As such, the senior deputy solicitor general told the court that the suspects had committed the offences of fraud and criminal breach of trust under the penal code. She further emphasised that by maintaining undisclosed accounts, the suspects had also committed an offence under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. When the financial crisis at the two institutions was detected by the central bank's regulatory process, the former board of directors had said that the deposits can be paid with the sale of Swarnavahini. The senior deputy solicitor general said that such is yet to happen. She also revealed in court, though the suspects had not paid the outstanding sum of 13 billion rupees to the 43,000 depositors of the two institutions, they had personally purchased vehicles amounting to 33.2 million rupees from the depositors' money, while also using the money to build houses of family members and to refurbish their cinema halls. 
The senior deputy solicitor general also objected to the suspects being granted bail, citing the possibility of the suspects influencing the witnesses and destroying important documents. Then the legal counsel appearing on behalf of the suspects, President's counsel Anuja Premaratna said that though his clients informed the central bank in 2012 of the financial crisis of the two institutions, the central bank failed to conduct a proper regulation. He also pointed out that during that time, the central bank had also failed to notify the public or depositors to not make deposits at the troubled institutions. While saying that the plaintiff had not submitted facts which warrants bail being refused to his clients, the legal counsel of the suspects requested the court to grant bail to his clients under any condition. After considering the facts, Colombo Chief Magistrate Mohamed Mihar said that the decision on the bail application will be delivered on the 15th of January and ordered the suspects to be remanded until then. In the meantime, a group of depositors of ETI Finance engaged in a silent protest in front of the court premises today as well. Now then, the Ranjan Ramanayaka contempt of court case finally came to an end today with the Samagi Janabalavege MP sentenced to four years of rigorous imprisonment by a three-member judge bench of the Supreme Court. Announcing the ruling, Justice Sisira Diabru stated that the Attorney General had proven the charges against the parliamentarian beyond reasonable doubt and that the MP's conduct during court proceedings had clearly cast serious doubts on the sincerity of his claims during his testimony in court. The MP will not have any chance of appealing the ruling handed down by the country's highest court. Samagi Janabalavege parliamentarian Ranjan Ramanayaka's most serious tussle with the country's judicial system to date erupted following public comments he made after a meeting with then Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe on January 21st, 2017. Addressing media personnel outside Temple Trees at the time, the then Deputy Minister accused the country's judiciary and legal fraternity of rampant corruption while singling out judges for allegations of bribery and a history of systemic bias in their rulings. In response to the comments which were widely publicised on conventional and social media platforms, petitions were filed in the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka, one by Bodhubala Sena member Venerable Magal Kande Sudatatera and the other by retired Air Force officer Sunil Pereira and the other by retired Air Force officer Sunil Pereira, accusing the then Deputy Minister of contempt of court. The petitions became the basis for a charge sheet that was filed by the Attorney General soon after. With that, last month the three-member Supreme Court bench comprising Justices Sisiradi Abru, Vijit Malal Goda and Preeti Padman Surasena scheduled further clarifications for today. In his pre-verdict comments, Justice Sisiradi Abru stated that the contempt of court charges levelled against the parliamentarian had been proven beyond reasonable doubt by the Attorney General and that a sentence would be delivered accordingly. Supreme Court Justice Diabru also stated that the evidence was crystal clear that the parliamentarian's comments in 2017 alluded to the majority of lawyers and judges in the country being corrupt and complicit in protecting criminals for financial gain. Justice Diabru also revealed that the respondent during his testimony in court had assured the court that his reference to judges in his statement was a mistake. The Supreme Court Justice, however, revealed that an examination of the respondent's conduct following the incident had clearly caused serious doubts to the credibility of such a claim. Justice Diabru cited further media statements made by the parliamentarian while court proceedings were still ongoing, where he openly maintained that he had no intention of withdrawing his allegations against the country's judiciary. Further, Justice Diabru also cited video evidence of another instance following the conclusion of Supreme Court hearings where the respondent had clearly stated once again that he would not withdraw his allegations and would instead stand firmly by them. The respondent had also told media personnel outside the Supreme Court premises that he was even willing to face imprisonment rather than withdraw his statement. Justice Diabru also pointed out that he had no intention of insulting the judiciary. Later statements clearly disproved such a claim as well. Thus, the Supreme Court Justice announced that the overwhelming evidence contained within such conduct had proven that his intention was in fact to insult the judiciary. The bench also rejected objections raised by the respondent's legal representative, claiming that the Supreme Court had no jurisdiction to hear such a case. Meanwhile, after examining all the facts presented today, the bench ruled that the Attorney General had proved beyond reasonable doubt that the parliamentarian was guilty of being in contempt of court. <laughs> Following this, the three-member bench sentenced the SJB MP to four years' rigorous imprisonment. Further, the parliamentarian will not be able to appeal such a sentence handed down by the country's highest court.
following this, MP Ramanayaka was transported to the Vadikada prison and then to the Palansena Youth Correctional Center for his mandatory quarantine period before commencing his prison sentence. Cabinet co-spokesperson Minister Uday Gambampil is confident that Sri Lanka can honour its debt obligations for the year without any delay or default. Addressing the weekly cabinet media briefing today, the minister also insisted that the government is neither soft nor hard when dealing with people's issues. You did mention about foreign debt repayments for last year and uh, the projections for this year. Yeah. But we were earlier yeah. told, even the finance minister maintained that the uh, debt repayment 2020 was in the region of about $4 billion. You're suggesting that it could be about 6.8. So it's more than 50% of what was generally believed. Last year, our total amount payable was $6.8 billion. But we were able to roll over bonds worth of $2.3 billion. In other words, holders of those bonds decided to reinvest in the bonds, roll over in capital as well as the interest as per the investment. That's why we were able to fully settle $6.8 billion worth loans by just paying $4.5 billion. This year, our total liability is $6,865 million. So more or less the same or slightly yeah. more. So we are confident as we did in the previous year, we will be able to settle the entire amount without any delay or without any default. This year, do you also expect a similar rollover like last year? Of course, yes. We encourage investors to roll over their investment as much as possible. If they do so, that will be a great relief for the government. The cabinet spokesperson also brushed aside the notion that the cabinet is divided over the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. There was no discussion at the cabinet about the 13th Amendment to determine whether there is any division in the cabinet. Present government is a coalition, consists of 15 political parties which represent the parliament. There are more parties which do not represent the parliament. Therefore, as in any other coalition, there are diverse views and that's how it should be. So in in this democratic process, we have the right to possess those views and to express those views. That's what we are doing. As a government, we make a collective decision and everybody will be bound by that decision. At the moment, as you know, there is a committee appointed by the cabinet to formulate a new constitution. Different parties of the coalition have submitted different views to this committee. After considering all those different views, they will come out with a new constitution. It will be deliberated at the cabinet and will make the final decision. The cabinet has given one year for this committee to formulate a new constitution. There is a great progress in that. In fact, this committee has decided to meet political parties to further discuss about the views submitted by those parties. In near future, this committee will meet both government and the opposition political parties to discuss about the new constitution. When asked whether the government is now taking a hard stance when dealing with issues, Minister Gamman Pillar had this to say. No, not at all. That's an impression and a feeling that you have. It might be influenced by your political views, your own experience, your biasness towards certain political ideologies. Government has not decided to be soft or hard at any time. Government has maintained a constant stand. When things happen in the way that you like, you may feel government is very soft now. The people who like the decision may feel a government is really soft, sensitive and all that. But the other may feel government is hard and insensitive. Nobody had an opinion poll or a referendum to find out the majority views and they change their stand time to time depending on the issue. Meanwhile, the decisions taken during the meeting of cabinet ministers yesterday were announced to the media today. Accordingly, the cabinet has granted approval for the extension of the concessionary period agreed upon for private sector employees amidst the coronavirus crisis up until the month of March 2021. At a meeting held by the task force established to look into the matter, it was agreed that amidst the crisis induced by COVID-19, the payment of salaries to private sector employees should continue without any loss up to 31st December 2020. It had been agreed that while providing proportionate opportunities to work for every employee, either by paying 50% or 14,500 rupees of the last month's salary, whichever is profitable from the two, as well as payment of contribution fee to Employees Provident Fund and Employees Trust Fund applicable to the paid amount by the employer. Meanwhile, as a result of local coconut production supply being insufficient for industries related to coconut kernel, the import of coconut kernel subject to certain conditions was approved by the Cabinet. Accordingly, 2,542 metric tons of coconut kernel have been imported during a period of eight months. 
The Cabinet of Ministers has also given the green light for entering into a memorandum of understanding between Sri Lanka Tea Board and Fusion Star China International Trade Company Limited to market pure salon tea both online and offline, utilizing the probabilities in Chinese tea market. The Cabinet consent was also given to amend the maximum compensation limit of the compensation formula in effect under the Termination of Employment Special Provisions Act No. 45 of 1971. Accordingly, the Cabinet of Ministers approved the proposal presented by Minister of Labour to increase the maximum amount of compensation from 125,000 rupees to 2,500,000 rupees. Meanwhile, the proposal to amend Land Acquisition Act No. 9 of 1950 to enable the acquisition of lands under a simple method which minimizes the time taken for the process of land acquisition and the payment of compensation under a uniform system has also been approved. As agreed upon by the Cabinet of Ministers to amend the Tea Control Act No. 51 of 1937, the legal draftsman has prepared the relevant bill and the Cabinet of Ministers approved a further amendment to the bill. Among the amendments are the inclusion of a definition in the Act as recycled tea for the tea that is discarded after categorization in the production process of tea factories. Following the amendment, the remainder will be defined as rejected tea after further extraction of the finished tea from the recycled tea. The Cabinet also gave the go-ahead to the proposal to initiate necessary measures to amend the Protection of Victims of Crime and Witnesses Act No. 4 of 2015. It will see the amendment of the provision a suspect should be remanded until the end of a trial to a remand for as long as the court deems fit. We will see you once more on the other side of this break. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching First at Night. Now, the Bandaranaik International Airport was commended with a certification of accreditation today for demonstrating a safe airport experience for all travellers in line with the recommended health measures by the Airport Council International. The accreditation serves as a certification that reassures the travelling public that the facility remains safe and that uh, precautions are being taken to reduce any risk to their health. The Airports Council International has certified the Bandaranaika International Airport's commitment to prioritising health and safety measures in accordance with International Civil Aviation Organisation Council and Aviation Recovery Task Force recommendations. The accreditation has been issued following a thorough examination of the health and safety measures adopted at BIA in response to the COVID-19 global pandemic situation under the ACI's Airport Health Accreditation Program. We have received the accreditation from Airport International Council for safety and health. With that, we can develop the tourism. After this accreditation, it says this is a very secure airport to travel. Hopefully, we will be getting the same accreditation for the Matala Airport soon. We all are very proud that we got this certificate. We'll be working on plans to receive the tourists. Now, this uh, certificate that we received from the highest international organization. So, this is good enough for us to work on our plans, develop the tourism industry. Sri Lanka and also to have a methodical planning. We will make sure that not only the operation side, even the administration, all the logistics side, all these areas will be properly coordinated in this uh, airport and we will make sure that all the tourists are safe and also the repatriation program will take place the same way according to a new plan. Meanwhile, another 165 tourists from Ukraine arrived in the island from the Matala Rajapaksa International Airport today. 178 Ukrainians who completed their tour of Sri Lanka also returned to their country today. Now, President of Myanmar, Yuen Mayint, has decided to confer the honorary religious title of Agga Maha Pandita on four Sri Lankan Buddhist monks. The honours are conferred in line with Myanmar's 73rd Independence Day anniversary. What's more, the honorary title of Agamaha Sadhamma Jatika Dhaja has been conferred on two Sri Lankan Buddhist priests, while a priest and a layman of Sri Lanka have also been conferred with the title Maha Sadhamma Jyotika Dhaja. Agamaha Pandit is an honorific title conferred by the government of Myanmar to distinguished, to distinguished Theravada Buddhists bhikkhus. Agga Maha Sadda Majotika Dhaja and Maha Sadda Majotika Dhaja are also titles conferred by the government of Myanmar to appreciate mostly the bhikkhus who have rendered a remarkable service to educate and who excel in Dhamma. 
Now, the Colombo District Court today ruled for the dismissal of a case filed against the BBC by chairman of the Derna Media Network, Dilith Jayavir. The case was filed back in 2012 when the BBC carried on its channel and website TNL TV content deemed damaging to the plaintiff's character for which an enjoining order had been issued against the local channel. However, the Colombo District Judge ruled that uh, the BBC was within its rights to carry the content despite this and was covered by its right as a media institution to inform the general public. In 2011, a case was filed by business tycoon Dilit Jayavira in the Colombo District Court against TNL TV for the telecast of content deemed damaging to his reputation. The action cited several false statements broadcast on the channel in June and October of 2011. Following the filing of submissions, the Colombo District Court issued an enjoining order against TNL TV on November 15th of that year. Further, when the case was taken up again on January 18, 2013, an interim injunction was issued against the channel. The enjoining order effectively prevented the channel from broadcasting any similar content targeting the petitioner until the end of legal proceedings. Subsequent to this order, the case was withdrawn in 2015 following TNL chairman Sean Vikramasinghe's undertaking to issue a public apology to the petitioner. Against this backdrop, the plaintiff had also filed a lawsuit in the Colombo District Court against the BBC in 2012 for carrying the controversial TNL TV content on its channel and website. Meanwhile, after a delay of several years, the Colombo District Court today moved to dismiss the case. The Colombo District judge ruled that the BBC was fully within its rights to carry the TNL TV content on its website. With that, the verdict was delivered in favour of the BBC. The ruling maintained that BBC had every right to broadcast statements made on TNL TV. The magistrate added that such a right was covered by the right of media institutions to keep the public informed. We will see you shortly. Bear with us. Welcome back. This is First at Night. Now, with the Hindu festival of Taipongal fast approaching, health authorities call on people to celebrate the festival whilst being indoors as much as possible. In the meantime, the Colombo district has been dethroned from the top spot in the list of daily infections. Colombo had been topping the list of daily infections in recent times. However, Kalutara district recorded more infections than Colombo yesterday. Eight more COVID-19 related fatalities were reported from Sri Lanka yesterday, with four of them being residents of the Colombo district. The victims include a 52-year-old prison inmate who had succumbed on the 6th due to COVID pneumonia. Further, a 61-year-old man who is a resident of Rajagiriya had lost his life on the 7th, where the cause of death was ruled as diabetes with COVID pneumonia. Fatalities confirmed last night also included two deaths which had occurred on the 8th. That included a 45-year-old man from Matakulia who had died due to COVID pneumonia and the 36 year-old woman from Colombo 12 who also lost her life due to COVID pneumonia. She had also been an epileptic. Meanwhile, three deaths had occurred on the 10th, which included a 51-year-old from Colombo 14 who succumbed due to COVID pneumonia. A 70-year-old woman had died on the same day also due to COVID pneumonia. She had been suffering with chronic kidney disease. A 67-year-old man from Kalutara South also succumbed on the 10th, with the cause of death being COVID pneumonia and septicemia. The remaining death had occurred yesterday, that of a 57-year-old man from Katankuri due to septicemia and COVID pneumonia. In the meantime, 584 COVID-19 cases have been confirmed in the island so far today. Yesterday, the figure was 569. Breaking the recent trend, the most number of infections were recorded from the Kalutara district with 110, while Colombo, which topped the list on a frequent basis, only recorded 37 infections. Apart from Kalutara and Colombo, 88 infections were confirmed from Gampa, 52 from Kegel, 33 from Ratnapura, 32 from Vaunia, 28 from Kandy, while 24 infections were recorded from the Kurunagla district yesterday. Further, 18 infections were reported from Gaul, 15 from Matale, 12 from Putlam, 10 from Polonia, were nine each from Nuarelia, Monaragala and three from Hambantota. What's more, two infections each were also detected from Anuradhapura, Batiklo, Ampara, Mulathu and Jaffna districts. The infections detected during yesterday also include a single foreign arrival and 78 cases involving people whose residences could not be confirmed. 
So far, a total of 31 parliamentarians have been identified as associates of the three COVID-19 infected parliamentarians, namely State Minister Dayasir Jayasekara, Minister Vasudeva Nanayakara and MP Rauf Hakim. Several of them have been subjected to PCR tests, while few parliamentarians have confirmed that their test results were negative. Accordingly, Minister SM Chandrasena and parliamentarians Shan Vijaylal de Silva, Lakshman Kiriyala, Nalin Bandara, Talat Atukorala, Tissatanayaka and M.A. Sumandiran have tested negative. In the meantime, Minister of Water Supply Vasudeva Nanakara, who celebrated his 82nd birthday, attended a celebration that was held at the ministry on the 5th of this month. The event was also attended by State Minister Sanat Nishantha. Meanwhile, the National Operations Centre for the Prevention of COVID-19 isolated the area of Anuvavatte in the Gangabada Grama Niladari division that comes under the police area of Paliagoda at 6 this evening due to a spike in infections in the area. Meanwhile, with the Hindu festival Taipongal commencing on the 14th, health authorities urge people to be indoors as much as possible. We have to celebrate this Taipongal day without going to friends or relatives' house, going for shopping and going for temple and avoid crowding places. And we have to avoid going out without wearing a mask. If we don't do, we can get corona infection. So our Ministry of Health requests all our Hindu friends to celebrate the Taipongal day at home with your family members without going out. As things stand, the total number of active COVID-19 cases in Sri Lanka is 6,672. Since the virus first broke out in the country back in March, a total of 42,621 patients have recovered from COVID-19, with 530 being discharged from hospitals today. At the Colombo Bourse, shares enjoyed their 11th straight session of gains with the All Share Price Index up more than 1% for a second consecutive session, ending up 1.09% at 7,282.24. With that, here's Dimantha Matthew with the market report. Today, the market reached a 65-month high as the SPI reached 7,282 points. So closing in on the 7,300 levels now. And we are seeing so much buying activity, especially among the retail community. There is strong buying interest emerging in speculative counters. So today's uptrend makes it the 11th consecutive day that the market is in green. And with this, what we can see is sizably high level of turnover is now being recorded on a continuous basis today. We saw turnover levels of around 8.5 billion rupees. With that, we are seeing the number of transactions also on the rise. It has reached 46,000 levels over the last few days. What we saw is high level of transactions, but it was in the range of 30 to 40,000 range. Now taking a look at the currency market, the rupee closed weak at 192 rupees and 50 cents to 194 rupees against the US dollar today after closing at 192 to 193 rupees yesterday. Let's take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other major currencies during the day. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.